There are many ways to travel, planes, trains, automobiles. My wife, Catherine, and I particularly like the automobile. Road trips are kind of our thing. Our kids might argue that that's not their favorite way to travel, but we really enjoy it. Part of the experience of a road trip for us, other than, you know, the roadside attractions and the detours that you take to go explore and, and find new places, part of the road trip is watching out for the signs that give you some indication that you're, you're heading the right direction, that you know where you're headed, where you're going. Indeed, those road signs give you a couple of pieces of information. You get the name of your destination. Hopefully, you see the name of where you're heading on one of those signs. And you get some information about distance, how, how far you have left to travel. In Almost Christmas, the resource that we're using throughout this Advent season here at North Cross to help guide our journey as we move towards Christmas, the author, uh, uh, authors rather note that those road signs tell us you may be closer now than when you've started, but you've still got a ways to go. And I love that idea just to kind of sum up Advent in general. You get a sense in the, ex in the experience of moving towards Christmas that you have traveled. We've, we, have, we have made some progress, but we know that there's still a way to go. Now, that's the tension of Advent, anticipating Jesus' coming, His birth, but knowing that Jesus is already here. So again, Advent for us is a season of of anticipation and celebration, of waiting and rejoicing. We've come a long way, but there is still a journey ahead. Now, John Wesley, the man credited with founding the United Methodist Movement, part the, what we're part of here at North Cross, didn't preach about Advent. He did preach, however, about this journey of, of growing as people of faith. In his sermon, Almost Christian, Wesley encouraged participants to move from being almost to being an altogether Christian. He listed a number of ways in which we settle for less than the fullness of the experience we could have of God. Wesley used the term almost to describe the Christian who had the outward form of godliness, looked, looked godly on the outside, but fell short of altogether godliness on the inside. Almost and all together. Again, over the next several weeks, we're going to wrestle with this idea. We're going to settle into this tension. Through the Advent season, we're going to ask, where are we at on our journey? Almost, all together. We'll do so by exploring some of the common themes which have guided many of us through a number of Advent seasons. The themes I'm thinking of are peace, hope, love, and joy. And each week, we'll take up one of these ideas, one of these themes, and ask, where are we at on the journey? How, how are we experiencing peace, hope, love, and joy? Again, through Advent, these could be our road signs. How far are we from where we started? How much farther might we have to go? We can remember that our destination and the distance we have traveled, and we might ask questions about what remains. So if you're up for the journey, look with me now at one of our first road signs. It emerges for us here. It reads, peace. If you read the sign and imagine we must be a long way from peace, I wouldn't argue with you. Our world is, is still in the grips of pandemic. War rages in parts of the world. Uh, famine and natural disaster are are commonly reported on our news. If you wanted to ask the question, how peaceful is the world? I think many of us would say not very peaceful. Many of us don't need to look around the world, however. We can identify moments of turmoil and unrest, unsettledness in our own communities, in our places of work, in our schools, in our homes. And perhaps when we're really honest, even in ourselves, that there's an unsettledness, perhaps, perhaps a, a disease inside of us. So where might we lack peace? We could ask that question. Or, or maybe the question we want to ask is, why do we lack peace? 
Now, while many are making merry and bright, many of us are angry elves. I'm reminded of a scene from Will Ferrell's Elf. There's a, a scene in a boardroom, there was a, a small person, right, a, somebody who is small in stature, and, and Will Ferrell's character believes himself to be an elf, and he sees this small person, and all the small people he knows have been elves, and so he calls this person an elf, which of course is, is not very respectful. This person gets mad and, and charges at Will. If you've, if you've seen the movie, you kind of know the scene I'm talking about. As Will is in a headlock and trying to come to grips with what's happening to him as he's been attacked by this man he's offended, Will says, oh, you're, you're an angry elf. Friends, I, I don't think that description is too far from the truth for many of us. We go through these holiday times, we enter into these times with family and friends and co-workers, and, and many of us, uh, just under the surface, are pretty frustrated perhaps even angry. Almost Christian, again, the resource that we're referring to throughout this study, suggests that that anger stems from fear and powerlessness. These ideas that anger is is the manifestation of really something deeper, that we're afraid of being powerless or afraid of being taken advantage of, or we're afraid of losing someone or afraid of losing something. We're afraid of the future. We're afraid of the past. And we feel powerless to to change it, to act in our world. When we think about all the things I've already described, war around the globe or famine or, or even some of the tension in our own families, many of us will just shrug our shoulders and say there's nothing we could do. We, we, we want it to be different. We wish it could be different, but, but we feel powerless to change it. This season, where we're singing joy to the world, where we're wishing people happy holidays and Merry Christmas, where we have this almost forced experience of happiness, many of us, again, maybe just under the surface, are unsettled, not very peaceful. Now, we're certainly not the first to experience these emotions. Long before the birth of Jesus, the people of God were afraid they too might be powerless against their enemies, powerless to affect change in their world, powerless to change their circumstances. They, many uh, perhaps, believed that there was no hope for them ever living in peace. Having been oppressed and subjugated to the rule of kingdom after kingdom, many of them angry and frustrated. To them, and perhaps to us, a message was shared through the prophet Isaiah. We're going to go back to that prophet, and we're going to continue to tell this piece of of his story. The prophet Isaiah is recorded in our Older Testament, and I'm going to keep coming back to this. So, hear God speak through Isaiah. Again, in our Older Testament, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 
Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Now, while this particular message spoke a word of hope to those who first heard it, those who Isaiah initially addressed, those words could come to their own, could come to be their own sort of road sign, pointing those that came after, pointing us even to a greater understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. For in the fullness of time, we looked back at the scripture and we said, wait a minute, this is about Jesus. This tells us something about what God is doing in and through Christ. We recognize that Jesus is born in a world in need of peace. Almost Christian uh, points out several uh, people in the the story of Jesus' birth. Let me just say it this way. Given the context into which Jesus is born... We recognize that context is the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had a certain kind of peace, the Pax Romana, Roman peace. And that peace was established and enforced brutally by military might. Again, while many of us might think of peace as an absence of conflict, and certainly the Roman peace was meant to to be an absence of conflict, The way that absence of conflict came to be was by a brutal force. When we read the word peace, however, in our Scripture, the word we usually translate as peace is shalom. Shalom is more than the absence of conflict. It speaks about completeness, of of wholeness. Again, The Roman Empire had their own ideas about what that looked like and what that was supposed to be about, what what peace was. Jesus, however, introduces a new way, a new idea of what wholeness and health and vitality, what peace can be. The news of Jesus' birth comes to the Roman official Herod, who's in charge of the area in which Jesus is born. It is not a surprise then that as he's perceived as a threat to the Roman peace, the way we deal with threats to Rome is to eliminate them. An order, a decree is sent out, we will read, that all those male children would be destroyed. The way to enforce Roman peace is through death. Jesus again though, comes to show us new life in a new way. His birth shows us what peace can really be, what peace could really look like. In this story, uh, spoiler alert, Jesus is not killed yet. He, gr- he grows, and, and His peace is offered as an alternative to that deadly Roman peace. Jesus will consistently proclaim as an adult, do not be afraid. He addresses those feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness that we note are often expressed as anger. And in this way, Jesus' peace, Jesus' shalom, is the antidote to that emotion. Peace as the antidote to anger. I think Almost Christmas does a really good job, if, if you read through that particular resource, I just give you the highlight of it here, of of giving us a sense of of how we could live into that kind of peace as an antidote to anger. And they lift up, the authors lift up three ways in which we can move towards the shalom that Jesus offers. The first is awareness. The second is acceptance. And the third is action. Becoming aware of the need for change, the, the need or the disruption in the world that would call for peace. Becoming aware of it is the first step, and then accepting that there are limits to what we can do and accepting that we might have a role to play, and finally coming to the the third part, action. And friends, I'm going to be honest with you, when when I think the first couple of ideas are pretty simple, pretty easy for me to observe in my own life, it's this third piece where things really, really get hard, action. Action not just believing that it should be different, not just recognizing that it should be different, but then working to make a difference. 
Jesus knows this conflict. Jesus knows the difficulty of living out the the faith that he's making possible. So Jesus gives us his peace. He gives us a piece of his peace. He gives himself to us. And that peace is then meant to grow in us that we might do what he does. We might become peacemakers. What do we mean we talk about experiencing peace and living as a peacemaker? These are words that you might have heard before, but what do we actually mean? Let me come back to John Wesley. I I mentioned that John Wesley is the founder, the one that creates what we come to know as the United Methodist Church that North Cross is a part of. In John Wesley's ideas about how to live out this faith, one of the, the rules that he suggests to his, that those that would follow his example is to do good. To do good. To work at doing good in the world. To, to see a need and meet a need. To, to come alongside those folks who, who need encouragement or support or help and, and, to, and to help to do good. That's part of what what I believe we're talking about here when we become peacemakers, that we would put into action this idea of bringing peace, wholeness, restoration, new life to the relationships around us, to the very world in which we live. In our newer testament, again, just picking up on that theme, there's a letter to the Ephesians And the Ephesians, uh, a fledgling church trying to figure out how to live out this life. And and the author of Ephesians in Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 32, offers this instruction, offers this way of living as a peacemaker. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen." Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do something to resolve the matter. Don't allow the devil a foothold. If you let this anger continue to fester, right, if you allow the hopelessness and the powerlessness that really is the root of that anger take hold in your life, then all kinds of of disease can transpire. Don't anger, don't let anger lead to sin. Don't steal. Work hard. Help others. You you get the sense here that there's work for us to do. It's not merely saying, I wish it was different. It's not simply a Christmas greeting and walking by. What What we're at here is not an almost Christmas, but an altogether Christmas, not an almost peace that pretends like everything is okay, but an altogether peace that works to restore the world, an altogether peace that could be the antidote to anger. So I ask here in this time of preparation for Christmas, we're, we're moving towards Christmas, and there's a number of opportunities for us to interact with folks and, and perhaps for our anger to get the best of us, for our, for our feelings of fear and powerlessness perhaps to bubble up in unhelpful ways, perhaps to find the brokenness in our relationships worked out in ways that are unhelpful. So let me just ask you this, who do you need to reconcile with? What broken piece of your life needs attention? Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to ask forgiveness from. 
Where do you see a need in the world? Where do you see a need for justice? And what action might you take to help the powerless find a voice, to use the gifts you've been given to make a difference, to act in such a way that you could look back and say, I did some good. Maybe, maybe we could just do this. Maybe as we're on this journey together, we're, we're trying things out, we're working this out, we're trying to figure it out, we're traveling down the road, we see that we've come a ways, but we know there's a ways still to go. Maybe what we could do is just this, come back to this passage I just read in, in Isaiah and ask, how is, how is Jesus represented here? How might I become more like that picture? Isaiah chapter 9, just take a look. Or you might pick up this Ephesians in our newer Testament, Ephesians 4. It's chock full of lots of great things, but Ephesians 4, just pick up verse 25 and, and following. And maybe identify one of those practices there. Maybe it's slandering. Maybe it's working in a different way. Maybe it's forgiving someone. Maybe it's, it's just restoring a relationship. Pick up one of those practices and and work at making peace this season. It might involve how you think or, or how you act, who you love, or, or how you receive love. I think alternatively, we could just go through the motions of another holiday season. Put up the lights and sing the songs and wrap the gifts and find ourselves just as empty afterwards as we were before. Or maybe we could move, move along in our journey. Maybe we could find ourselves a little farther down the road than where we started. Settle for an almost peace, we could. But maybe this year, maybe this year we move closer to an altogether peace, the shalom of Jesus. We've come away, but there's still a distance to travel. So let us pray. Would you pray with me? Indeed, God, I know that there is much that we push to the side, ignore, or, or hide, much that we don't want to think about or wrestle with. So God, help us. Help us to see the road sign of peace and to ask the questions we need to ask. How far have we come? And let us celebrate that. We're not where we started. And give us hope that as we continue to move closer to you, you'll be there to help us, to strengthen us, to support us. When we get it wrong, when we get off track, you'll show us a better way. Surround us with friends and family and loved ones and coworkers and and all those other relationships, just those acquaintances that will give us an opportunity to act for justice, to practice love, to be peacemakers. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.